Welcome to the podcast. If you'd like to listen to an ad-free version of this episode and all of our episodes, then search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. That's our premium channel where all of our ad-free and advanced episodes live all in one place. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Search it on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. Even try it for three days free. You're about to take a deep dive into one of the biggest true crime cases in the universe, or at least on our part of the planet. From the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. So you sent over a case. Um, That's both heartbreaking and legally perplexing. Yeah. We're diving into the Brian Koberger case. Okay. Specifically his request regarding courtroom attire. And why it's causing such a stir. What's captivating about the situation is how a seemingly simple choice, right. like what someone wears to court, can become yeah. a focal point with such significant implications. Absolutely. For those needing a refresher. Brian Koberger is facing charges for the murders of four University of Idaho students right. back in 2022. Mm. Now he's filed a request to ditch the standard jail jumpsuit in favor of a suit and tie for his upcoming court appearances. Interesting. What makes this so interesting? His lawyer is arguing that wearing what she calls street clothing will reduce potential for prejudice against her client, especially given the media spotlight on his appearance. You've included some fascinating research on how clothing influences first impressions. Right. One study found that juries were more likely to believe a defendant dressed in a suit versus prison garb. Wow. Even when presented with the same evidence. Interesting. So is Koberger's request simply human bias or a calculated strategy by the defense? His lawyer, Ann Taylor. Is specifically calling out the intense media focus on Koberger's appearance. Okay. They're saying that could sway public opinion, even potentially impacting a jury. And his defense team is highlighting the media frenzy around his booking photo. I see. Especially the attention given to his facial hair. Yeah. It really does raise the question, in the age of instant news and social media, can someone's appearance, right. something as changeable as facial hair, unfairly influence how they're perceived by potential jurors? And there is no denying the media attention this case is drawn. You mentioned almost a thousand media stories focusing on Koberger's appearance yeah. in just the five days after he was transferred to Ada County Jail. Absolutely. But on the other side, you have the victim's families understandably furious. Right. Seeing Koberger trying to present a polished image. While facing such horrific accusations. Kaylee Goncabs' mother, Christy, had a particularly poignant quote in one of the articles. She said, it makes me sick that he sits there in his suit and all dressed up in a fresh haircut. Wow. It's hard to even imagine the pain and anger she must be feeling. While her reaction is completely understandable, yeah. could the family's anger be inadvertently playing into the defense's hands? That's a good question. By focusing on the suit, are we being distracted from examining the evidence objectively? That's a point worth considering. It seems like Koberger's defense team may be trying to use the intense media scrutiny to their advantage. It certainly raises questions about their overall strategy. Mm-hmm. Are they legitimately concerned about potential prejudice? Or is this a calculated tactic to sway right. public and jury perception? Especially since this isn't the first time courtroom attire has sparked debate. Right. You mentioned a few past cases where a defendant's clothing became a point of contention. Exactly. Remember the case of... The judge's ruling there set a precedent that could influence Koberger's case. Okay. It'll be interesting to see how much weight legal precedent might have here. Yeah. Given the unique circumstances surrounding this case. Speaking of legal precedent, it seems like there's a bit of a gray area when it comes to specific guidelines. For what a defendant can wear in court. Right. You're right. While there are rules about courtroom decorum when it comes to a defendant's attire, those decisions are often left up to the judge's discretion. Which adds another layer of complexity to this whole debate. And in Koberger's case, the Ada County Jail, where he's being held, doesn't even offer alternative clothing options to their standard jumpsuit. It's definitely a unique situation, legally speaking. Wow. But even beyond the legal aspects, there's a fascinating psychological component at play here. I mean, it's well documented that appearance influences our perceptions. Right. Countless studies have shown that we make snap judgments based on visual cues, often subconsciously. And those first impressions can be tough to shake, even when we're faced with contradictory evidence. Exactly. And that's why what Koberger wears to court matters, regardless of whether it's fair or not. Mm. A suit and tie tend to project professionalism, respectability, 
even trustworthiness. It's almost like dressing for the verdict you want. Precisely. And this isn't just about the clothes themselves, but the message they convey. These are all qualities that could potentially work in Koberger's favor during his trial. It makes you wonder if his defense team is intentionally trying to counteract the image of a cold-blooded killer by presenting him in a suit. Do you think they're aiming to make him appear more relatable, more human to the jury? It's certainly a possibility. You included an article by a jury consultant who states that jurors are more likely to connect with a defendant who appears like someone they might encounter in their everyday life. Hmm. The psychology behind that is undeniable. So in essence, it's possible that Koberger's attire, something as simple as a suit, could subtly influence the jury's perception of him even before any evidence is presented. It's a valid concern, and it speaks to the broader issue of unconscious bias. We all have preconceived notions, and those notions are often shaped by visual cues whether we're aware of them or not. Which brings us back to the heart of this dilemma. How do we reconcile those understandable human reactions with our justice system's presumption of innocence until proven guilty? It's a delicate balance, oh. and the victim's families are understandably upset viewing Koberger's attire as a manipulation tactic. It feels to them like a way to downplay the severity of his alleged crimes. And you can't fault them for that. It's hmm. easy to see why they would feel that way. Oh, correct. But at the same time, we have to remember that Koberger is entitled to a fair trial, right? And part of that means not letting our emotions dictate our perception of the evidence. Absolutely. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Ensuring that justice is served while also acknowledging the very real and very raw emotions surrounding a case like this. And how those emotions are managed both inside and outside the courtroom can really impact how justice is ultimately perceived and delivered. So where do we go from here? Koberger's next court appearance is coming up soon, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, scheduled for Thursday in Boise. Okay. And it will be live streamed on YouTube. Wow. So the world will be watching. And what Koberger wears will undoubtedly be scrutinized. Right. Especially after this request. It'll be interesting to see what the judge decides. I know, right? Will they side with Koberger's lawyer and permit street clothing? Or will they rule in favor of the status quo, acknowledging the potential emotional impact on the victim's families? It's a tough call. And this decision could set a precedent for future high-profile cases. You're right. This case is shining a light on a very gray area of the law. And it begs the question, Yeah. should there be stricter, more definitive guidelines for courtroom attire, especially in cases that have garnered significant media attention? It's a question with no easy answers. On the one hand, right. having those clear guidelines could help minimize potential bias. It could even alleviate some of the anguish the victim's families are experiencing. Yeah. At least they know what to expect, yeah. that the defendant wouldn't be allowed to present themselves in a way that feels disrespectful to the memory of their loved ones. I agree. Consistent guidelines could help ensure the focus remains on the evidence, not the defendant's clothing. Right. But then again, every case is different. Sure. A one-size-fits-all approach might not always be appropriate or fair. Right. And there's the question of the defendant's right to present themselves as they see fit. Right. Some might argue that choosing their clothing even in the courtroom is part of their defense strategy. It's a classic dilemma with no easy solutions. It highlights the complexities of our justice system and how something as seemingly superficial as clothing can become a battleground for much larger issues of fairness perception and how we ultimately pursue justice. This deep dive has certainly given us a lot to think about. As we await the judge's decision, it makes you wonder, how can we balance the right to a fair trial with the undeniable influence of appearance? Is there a way to ensure justice is served, not just perceived, both in this case and in the future? That's the million dollar question. And unfortunately, there are no simple answers. But mm. by acknowledging the nuances, the gray areas, and the very real emotions at play, we can at least strive for a system that is as fair and impartial as possible. Well said. And to our listeners, thank you for sharing these thought provoking articles with us. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this complex issue. You can find us on our website or social media channels to share your perspective. Until next time, this has been The Deep Dive. In a world where the darkest secrets lie just beneath the surface. Well, they said it was an accident, but the evidence says otherwise. Where hidden killers roam unnoticed in the shadows. Well, I think you would definitely be looking at a, a blend of toxic, very bad narcissistic personality traits, and they will be vengeful and possibly resort to violence. Join Tony Bruschi as he uncovers the truth behind the most chilling cases. They said it was an accident, but the evidence clearly says otherwise. Each episode, we dig deep 
into the minds of those who commit the unthinkable. To your point on narcissism, he thinks in his own mind how witty he is, yeah. but he lost that jury. I, I was I was done with him in two minutes. From unsolved mysteries to infamous crimes. Geez, you've just talked about how you've taught yourself how to do everything under the sun. I bet you did a YouTube video, how to best kill somebody with a knife. Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi takes you where few dare to go. How does someone with such a dark secret go unnoticed? for so long with multiple new episodes every single day we're not just telling stories we're seeking justice listen now on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts just search for hidden killers with tony brewski